Hello, valued viewers. I hope you're all doing very well. This video is the Pennsylvania Railroad's Q2, a lesson not learned. Enjoy. As I mentioned in the Q1 video, the Pennsylvania Railroad has to be commended for at least trying to save steam. However, the Pennsylvania Railroad was not one that was in a position to be throwing money away. And quite frankly, they were throwing away money by the millions with these experimental types. The Q1, the Q2, the S1, the S2, the T1, etc. And it's no surprise that once World War II concluded and the super freight revenue that that war had brought to railroads such as the Pennsylvania Railroad, that the Pensy went into financial trouble not long thereafter. And when it comes to the Q2, all I can say is that Pensy must have some really enthusiastic engineers that convinced the Board of Governors there to build these things. Because they, they had to have convinced them that turning the cylinders around on the Q2 was going to solve the design's overall problems that were discovered in the Q1. And they had to have been so enthusiastic that the Board of Governors and, and whatnot in charge of procurement decided to build 26 of them. And as much as I admire the Pensy once again for trying to save steam, this was not a sound business decision for a railroad that was already tight on cash. So we may recall that the Q1 was a 4644 wheel arrangement. The Q2 this time was a 4464 wheel arrangement. And unlike the prototype, all the cylinders on this engine face forward. The Q2 locomotive had more reasonable proportions than the Q1 and also provided an enormous amount of pulling power with some 115,000 pounds of tractive effort when you add a, a trailing truck booster to it. However, like the T1, its divided drive design and unorthodox technology led to more problems than the railroad was ultimately willing to solve and admit. And this is why for the life of me I can't figure out why they would order 26 of these things when one would have sufficed and would have figured all these things out. In a way, this situation kind of reminds me of the Chesapeake in Ohio with the M1 class and when they bought three of those monsters when one, once again, would have sufficed to figure out the issues. And so far, if the, all that wasn't enough, no other railroads ever adopted the duplex and some lines remained loyal to steam even longer than the Pennsylvania Railroad did. And that just goes to show you what these other railroads actually thought of the concept. The Q2's performance capabilities were more than offset by its flaws. These duplex steam locomotives were promised to be the power of the future and they failed to live up to their expectations. The railroad took another look at the diesel electric at that point. And while these new Q2 duplex locomotives were being delivered, their fate was already sealed. They were the last new steam locomotives ever delivered to the Pennsylvania Railroad, and needless to say, their careers were very short. And although doomed by the efficiency of diesel-electric technology, the thought of streamlined duplexes regularly racing across the Midwest at 120 miles an hour is pretty intriguing. So, one really has to wonder how the duplex might have developed if the diesel had never come to dominate the railroad industry. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Would duplex technology have taken over the steam locomotive uh, industry and become the dominant motive power? Personally, I don't think duplexing would have, but maybe the turbos would have, or the turbines. And in its most simplistic terms as I could possibly make it, one of the biggest reasons why the Q2 didn't last as long as maybe it could have was the fact that it wasn't really outperforming the J1 2104 Texas type locomotives, the standard stuff. And then when you're dealing with a relatively unproven technology such as the duplexing still was for the Pennsylvania Railroad, you were looking at much higher maintenance costs on top of that. And one of the biggest factors cited by the Pennsylvania Railroad as to why the Q2 was uh, retired as quickly as it was, was because of high cost. Now, I've just looked at several tables that reference their fuel and water appetites. And that high cost simply, again, had to be related to maintenance because I don't see their fuel and water uh, consumptions as being out of line as compared to the actual size of the Q2 itself, which is an enormous locomotive for what it is. But one table I did look at, look at suggests that the Q2 costs over $10,000 more to perform intermediate uh, maintenance than the J1210 uh, for Texas type did. But also, as an article stated that I read, the Q2 had twice as many cylinders as the J1 and also had a, a number of unusual high-tech features, which pretty much aren't standard issue, which also cost more to maintain. 
But sifting through these articles and, and whatnot in these publications, the consensus of these maintenance people appears to be that the Q2, if the Q2 would have significantly outperformed the 2104 J1 Texas, it might have been worth the effort to keep them around. But the locomotives were so close in actual performance that it was not worth the extra cost. So, in normal use, the Pennsylvania Railroad wasn't getting any more train pulling work out of the Q2 than it got out out of the much simpler and much lower costing 2104 Texas J1, which given the far higher power the Q2 to attain and test is a bit alarming. And on top of that, the Pennsylvania Railroad had a 50 mile an hour general freight train speed limit and that effectively eliminated any horsepower advantage the Q2 had over the Texas 2104. So operating costs became that detrimental. The Q2 was designed for fast freight service. Internal Pennsylvania Railroad documents when it was being designed and built referred to it as a high-speed freight locomotive. Apparently, however, its superiority over the Texas type only became noticeable at speeds higher than the Pennsylvania Railroad ran freight trains. So once again, why were these things allowed to be built? So while I do in fact think that the early maintenance costs on the Q2s would have been substantially higher than the standard locomotives, simply because the technology wasn't perfected and it was proprietary stuff or brand new stuff that was on these locomotives. But the realization is this. The Pennsylvania Railroad didn't get their bang for the buck out of this locomotive. And that was mainly because of the self-imposed restrictions that they had on their freight service lines. So in the long run, had they been allowed to you know, continue on and perform, I don't think the reasoning for eliminating the Q2s was going to be mechanical, but rather what they got out of them and what their operational costs were in comparison. That and along with how quickly the Pennsylvania Railroad had to embrace dieselization once World War II had ended. I mean, let's face it, folks, diesels were just that much cheaper than steam. I mean, it's why, obviously, everyone was going to it. Okay, so as built, the Q2 was a rigid frame four-cylinder locomotive that may have been the epitome of superpower steam locomotive designs. And quite frankly, the Q2s were the most powerful 10-coupled steam locomotives ever produced. And had they been allowed to perform as they were designed to, these monsters were going to be the grain house of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And the Q2 could hang its hat on being the most, by far, successful duplex design ever built. And folks, for me, the bottom line with the Q2 is simply this. Once again, only one of them should have been purchased, not a fleet of 26. And then once it was realized that they weren't going to be seriously outperforming the Texas type locomotives, you know, the standard issue stuff, and that way they only would have had one locomotive that was being severely underutilized because of the 50 mile an hour imposed speed limits for freight service. And then on top of that, the locomotive would have been determined to not be able to outperform the 2104 Texas type or the J1 type at those speeds of 50 miles an hour or less. It would have been far less costly for them. But otherwise, the Q2s were fairly successful. They're just severely underutilized and they were easy targets to be out of service by that 1951 with the rapid onset of dieselization by the Pennsylvania Railroad. And they will go down, in my mind, as a serious waste of money by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Maybe even more so than the M1s of the Chesapeake and Ohio. That part is debatable, but it is what it is. So with that, the following specifications apply to the Pennsylvania Railroad's Q2-4464 duplex locomotive. Alrighty, so the total number built was 26, and they were built between 1944 and 1945. The main driver size was 69 inches. The length of the locomotive was 124 feet 7 and a quarter inches. The width was 11 feet 4 inches. The height was 16 feet 5 and a half inches. The adhesive weight over the drivers was 393,000 pounds. The locomotive weight by itself was 619,100 pounds. The tender weight was 430,000 pounds with a combined weight of 1,049,100 pounds. The fuel type was soft coal. The fuel capacity was 39.86 short tons. The water capacity was 19,020 U.S. gallons. The fuel consumption was 12.5 tons of coal and 16,600 gallons of water per hour. The boiler was 106 inches. The boiler pressure was 300 psi. The front cylinder was 19 and three quarter inches by 28 inches. The rear cylinder.
cylinders were 23 and 3 quarter inches by 29 inches and they used all shirt valve gears. The power output was 6,645 drawbar horsepower and overall tested to just under 8,000 horsepower. The tractive effort was 100,816 pounds without a booster and with booster is 115,816 pounds and the factor of adhesion was 3.9. The last run of the Q2 was in 1951 and none of this class were preserved. And with that, I'll wrap up this video, and I shall thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed the content, please leave a like, and also subscribe if you have not done so, as both features help the channel grow enormously. And if you don't wish to support the channel's efforts uh, via the super thanks, uh, you can visit our print shop at nickelplatelimited at etsy.com. And we thank you once again.